Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Amy Murphy, a professor at the USC School of Architecture. And on behalf of Interim Dean Willow Bay and our entire academic community of faculty, staff, and students, I extend a warm welcome. As we gather here tonight, the University of Southern California acknowledges that this event is taking place on the unceded territory of California, home to nearly 200 tri tribal nations. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with the Native communities to secure meaningful partnerships and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. USC is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Keech and Tongva people. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength of all indigenous people the, the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing Josh Kuhn. Josh is the inaugural Vice Provost of the Arts at USC. He is a professor and chair in cross-cultural communications at the Annenberg School. His books include Autotopia, Music, Race, and America, Songs in the Key of Los Angeles, and you shall know us by the trail of our vinyl. And lastly, Double Vision, the photography of George Rodriguez. As a curator, his projects have appeared in the Los Angeles Public Library, LACMA, the Getty Foundation, and the California African American Museum, as well as the Grammy Museum in several other locations. As an artist, his work has been exhibited at SF MoMA, Prospect New Orleans, and the Steve Turner Gallery. He is the recipient of a, Bron a Berlin Prize and an American Book Award, and in 2016 was named a MacArthur Fellow. Please welcome Vice Provost Josh Kuhn to the podium. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Professor Murphy. Uh, welcome, everyone. It is wonderful to see so many of you for this inaugural program celebrating the arts, design, culture, humanity, and our university community. I'm pleased to be here in my new role, which is like a month and a half in this new role. Um, haven't messed up yet, but we'll see. Um, as vice provost for the arts. And in this role, I will remain on faculty, um, uh, as was mentioned, at the USC Annenberg School and continue, where I'll continue to teach and advise students. Uh, I'm also partnering in this new role with USC's art schools and USC's museums to create university-wide signature arts programs and to activate the arts all around our campuses. I could not be more pleased to be here celebrating the School of Architecture in partnership with USC Visions and Voices. Give it up for Visions and Voices. There we go. At this inaugural program featuring Mark Rios, an alum of the USC School of Architecture and founder of Rios, a global firm based here in LA. We all know and admire his signature projects, including Gloria Molina Grand Park in downtown LA, California Endowment, and Nokia Plaza at LA Live. Mark received his Bachelor of Science in Architecture from USC and both Master of Architecture and Master of Landscape Architecture degrees from Harvard University. Mark was chairman of landscape architecture at USC from 2001 to 2007 and has been on the faculty at UCLA. Earlier this year, Mark received the USC Architectural Guild Lifetime Achievement Award. Mark practices with a vision to imagine, design, and build complete environments that cross boundaries of disciplinary design. His eclectic interests, innate curiosity, and ability to see things from multiple angles propel the projects the firm works on beyond borders to incorporate the creative alchemy of a multidisciplinary approach to design and architecture. Joining Mark as moderator in conversation is the award-winning architecture and design journalist, Francis Anderton. Francis is the author of Common Ground, Multifamily Housing in Los Angeles, winner of a Gold Award for Best Regional Nonfiction from Forward Reviews. She writes a regular newsletter on design and architecture for KCRW. 
for which he previously hosted the show DNA, Design and Architecture, and produced the current affairs shows Which Way LA and To The Point. She's also co-produced short films for the nonprofit Housing Developers Community Corporation of Santa Monica and Venice Community Housing. Francis teaches a seminar class on housing typologies here at USC in the School of Architecture. I'm a huge fan and admirer of both of their work uh, with deep admiration for their scholarship and contributions to society. So please join me first in welcoming to the stage Mark Rios. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's really special for me to have Amy Murphy introduce the evening tonight. I have huge respect and admiration for Amy. And thank you, Josh, wherever you just walked off to, for that wonderful introduction tonight. It's really a perfect way to set the stage for our conversation, to be thinking about his role at USC and sort of what he's about to accomplish here. I want to thank the USC Vision Voices program for sponsoring these university-wide conversations, which help to creatively link all of us and inspire us by listening to each other. And I want to thank everyone at the USC School of Architecture, my alma mater, for making this evening possible, and most importantly, giving me the first opportunity to think broadly about design and my responsibilities and obligations to make the world a little better, and for helping me begin almost 50 years ago the conversation tonight on design thinking. I'm also really thrilled to be here with my long-term friend and colleague, Francis Anderton, the provocative and thoughtful curator of architecture and design. Francis has asked many, many um, questions of all of us, and she's brought to life issues and people for all of us to consider. I want to thank all of you for joining our conversation tonight, for your curiosity to think about the power of boundless curiosity. On the screen tonight, you're seeing projects by Rios, a collective of diverse and talented people, from their educational backgrounds and geographies to their personal histories and experiences. Our firm has 10 partners, 12 studio directors, eight technical and design directors, and more than 250 super talented people working in lots of places together. Collectively, and I'm really proud of this, we speak 28 different languages and have training in the fields of urban design, planning, architecture, landscape, experience design, interior, product, graphic, furniture design, as well as media, branding, filmmaking, economics, communication, sustainability. It takes every one of us. We are all contributors and we are all really grateful for each other. We come together at Rios with different personalities and interests to create a design ecosystem. Together we pursue common values and find solutions that bridge our individual thinking and preconceptions. The range of our work spans from cups to cities, community plans to short films, big aspirational visions to small little beautiful things. Um, our superpower, at least I hope it is, is curating ideas from a variety of sources, people, and disciplines, and overlapping them to find unpredicted results. It doesn't always work, but it takes us farther than we might expect. Inclusive thinking is really powerful. USC is the perfect place for Francis and me to have this conversation tonight. The university is the repository of information, the place of research, exploration, and the home of people who ask questions. In professional life, we become somewhat entrenched in our own ideas, specialties, colleagues, and methodologies. But the premise of a great university, like USC, is a place of many. Many ideas, many thinkers, many fields of study, many curious people of all ages and interests. 
the potential for inclusive thinking, perhaps more than any other time in your life, is here at the university. So make the most of it. And for those of us whose time at school is sort of behind us, always work to create a life for yourself that is centered on the cross-pollination of ideas. We must always orchestrate our lives to be surrounded by others who encourage us to ask questions and think differently than we do. If we are going to solve significant issues, if we are going to make the world healthier, if we're going to help foster peace and respect for differences, we will only do it by being open and looking for unexpected connections. I'm honored to be the first participant of the USC Vision of Voices and the USC School of Architecture lecture series, Crossing Design Borders. The mission of this annual forum is to invite people who look broadly to other disciplines, other ways of thinking, and to share their stories in the hopes of inspiring all of us to make that effort to unleash our own curiosities of non-traditional sources of information and problem solving. So what's the agenda for tonight? What is this conversation about? How many of you here tonight have heard about the process or idea of design thinking? Raise your hand. Okay. There are lots of definitions to what it means, but most broadly, it means solving problems in a non-linear iterative process. And that's exactly what design education is all about. That is what we are all still learning to do. The Harvard School of Business has published substantially and has classes focused on the process and value of design thinking. They explain a four-step design process. Step number one, clarify. Focus on the problem at hand. Define the problem statement. What has prevented a solution in the past? Observe without assumptions. Collect information and experiences. Step two, ideate. Brainstorm new ideas to solve the statement. Devise new and innovative ideas. Actively avoid preconceptions. Step three, develop. Evolve concepts by critiquing a range of possible solutions. This may involve testing, experimenting, prototyping to understand a concept's viability. And step four, implement. Reflect on the results, test the concepts, reiterate, and be open to starting over. I totally get this process. It is a way of working that can be applied to any problem statement or design typology. But I have two big problems with it. And what I'd like to talk about tonight is an advanced, enriched process for design thinking. Let's call it Design Thinking 2.0. And Harvard, I think you need to step up your definition and expand it. I believe the process they outline will never create great innovation. They describe it as a sequential process that someone goes through, the simplest missing piece of information, their biggest truth that they don't say is that you cannot do it alone. They never mention the word curiosity, research about places you've not been, ideas you don't know, questions that may not have been asked. Being an out there, aggressive, curious detective is the heart of design thinking. An active process of finding non-expected, unrelated material enables a problem to be repositioned and innovation to happen. So I would like to add a little bit to Harvard's definition. <laughs> Step one, I would add, what are the three unrelated fields where I might find answers? Reach outside and ask questions that are outside the box. Do not focus in to define the problem, focus out. Step two, ideate. Incorporate brainstorming from others. Be inclusive with ideas. Get ideas from the broadest places. Trust your intuition and curiosity to aggressively look beyond. Step three, develop. Create concepts that incorporate ideas from others that you did not think of. Test, try, ask, critique, 
to determine if that idea could work. Have a critic that you really trust that can say anything to you. And step four for implement, always start over again. Gather what you've learned and start over. You are required to do this at least three times. You can't go through it once and find innovation. All these decisions are about being inclusive, thinking outside yourself, your field, your experiences. I believe design thinking cannot happen alone, but necessitates broad interaction, and frankly, it involves some conflict. Others to stir the pot. That is the only way innovation can happen, working outside our norms and often our comfort zones. The focus of this conversation tonight is for all the students in the room. And that means all of us. Many here are getting their first degree at USC, but this is just a jumping off point, an introduction to formulate a thinking process for an entire lifetime of learning. Embrace your broadest interests. Be iterative in your thinking. Always set an agenda for learning a new field, a new craft, or a new culture to contribute and amplify your base field of study. Surround yourself with people that do not agree with you and those who know things that you don't know. Give yourself permission to evolve in an unscripted way to become the person you do not yet know. Follow your interests and your intuition. And so with that, I wanna welcome Francis out on stage here and let's begin our conversation tonight. Mark, so lovely to see you in the pink. Nice to see you. <laughs> As always, I feel like you've always been in the pink since, since we met oh so many years ago, back in the 90s, I think, when you were working on the children's school at Universal. Um, hi, everybody. It's, it's really an incredible honor to be, to be asked to talk to you, Mark, and to be hi, in yeah. the room with, with my, um, with my UC, USC colleagues, um, which is, is, is such a privilege in itself. So this is a really fascinating topic, and you've thrown up quite a few provocations just in your, you know, very gently delivered but quite provocative um, talk that you just gave. Um, and what, and you've, you've taken various terms like design thinking, and you've said, let's turn it into design thinking 2.0, and, um, and you've thrown out um, various new ways to sort of position the role of the designer. And one of them you have re referred to as the curious detective. So just to further provoke, I'm going to suggest that we could use the word curious detective, but we could also use the word pirate. <laughs> and why have I brought up, why have I brought up pirates and piracy? Any of you in this room, which is probably many of you, who is familiar with your architectural sources will know of Buckminster Fuller. And back in 1969, as I was reminded by a young designer the other day named Austin Kahn, back in 1969, Buckminster Fuller wrote his brilliant operating manual for Spaceship Earth. And in this manual, he basically argued against over-specialization, and he argued against tapping the brilliance of others. But he had a very clever way into this argument, and it's going to take us to all that Mark and I are gonna talk about. He said that the, the successful leaders in the world, back in the day when most people thought the world was flat, were the pirates. The pirates who could sail, who had command of the ships, who knew the world was round, and who went from land to land to land, learning from other places, like you said, that Harvard doesn't encourage people to do enough. Finding experts in different places from different cultures who had different knowledge from each other. And only the pirate got all the knowledge, or betook from all of these experts. And that made the pirate who became the king, and sometimes the queen, um, I have a pirate queen in my ancestry, by the way, Queen Granuaire of Ireland. Love that. Just sidebar, Queen Granuaire of Ireland was a pirate, and she was fantastic. And she, in a way, acted on that. So anyway, the pirate became the one that tapped all the specialists. Now, I turn over to you, Mark, and say, 
in your very gentle, kind way, are you, as the head of this company that has always worked to be multidisciplinary, are you trying to be a bit of a pirate? Well, I love talking about pirates. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was dressed like a pirate. Oh, the pirates are very over. swashbuckling. They have yes, some great gear. They do. You know, I think that um, maybe we try to be, I'm going to say again, Pirates 2.0, because I think the difference between how we all want to work today is um, through generosity. And that I think we want to empower everyone around us as opposed to hold everything to us. And so I think pirates of the past, you know, wanted to be kings. And um, I think there are some generations of pirates that still exist, but I think um, I like the idea of pirates spreading power and spreading information. And so I hope that I'm um, in that category as opposed to the one. Spreading, but also, also absorbing. Yeah, and absorbing being very is. And very open to it. And hence, leading, presumably, to innovation. And one can look at, because that's part of what this is about, isn't it? To also gently, generously win in the game mm -hmm. of, <laughs> of, of... Piracy. Of, <laughs> piracy, <laughs> piracy and design, and yes. just accomplishing, yeah. accomplishing projects. So let's talk a bit about... Can I say one other thing about pirates? <laughs> I think that it's pirates are interesting because pirates had a sense that they could be um, world citizens, global citizens, that they could like make a mark on the entire world. And I like that if we're going to think of ourselves as pirates, we have to think of ourselves as having that responsibility and that potential that we can sort of make that kind of change. And exactly, and that was exactly what Bucky Fuller, who has been such an interesting person to sort of read and follow his work, because because he actually was arguing back in 1969 that if you didn't have that sort of pirate attitude, borrowing from all this wealth of other people's knowledge, you um, it would preclude a, a comprehensive thinking. Specialization is not the key to success, in his words. He, he argued that the potentially integratable techno-economic advantages accruing to society from myriad specializations are not comprehended integratively. You are trying to think integratively with your work, is that right? That's what I've understood yeah. about your yeah. firm. Yeah. So, so, and also from looking at, at the firm now, you really do have projects all over the place. So you are doing this taking to and also absorbing from. But tell us, in term, let's talk a little bit about sort of when the rubber hits the road in terms of operating in this very hybridized, multidisciplinary way that, that you, uh, you, you, you aspire to and, and, and encourage everyone in this room, room to work towards. Sort of what, what's sort of really involved? I mean, I did hear you mention the word conflict. Um, so, so is, uh, do you want a sort of creative friction by having a group of people with related but different disciplines sitting around the table working on any one of the projects you might have shown? Sort of what, how, how does it manifest in, in your actual process? You know, I think um, all of my colleagues would um, admit that it is a messy process. And, and at moments, it's slightly painful. And, <laughs> but what it does do, hopefully, it produces a set of ideas that are a collection and a hybrid of different people's ideas and thoughts and opinions. And it's not a hierarchical structure that someone has an idea and people implement that idea. And so the best idealized way is that somehow you have these creative conversations and all ideas are equal and the best ideas rise to the top and that's the way you idealize it. But it probably isn't quite like that. Um, there is a sense of, of struggle and new information that comes in and that changes things and it's not a um, <clears throat> linear kind of cyclical iteration. It's about um, new things that spontaneously evolve the idea or mature the idea. So I think that we have a commitment 
And I think we should all have a commitment to be open and embracing many ideas because that's the only way we're ever going to make substantial change. And but again, in your firm, so you refer to the fact that you design everything from cups to cities. And I, I really want to say your cups are fantastic. I, I mean, they're really a good shape. They're like the perfect cups. But anyway, and, and, and the cities are good too. So, so cup to... Of course, <laughs> duh. No. <laughs> so, now that's, you, you kind of paraphrased, your phrase was paraphrased from the Italian architect Ernesto Rogers, who famously said he himself wanted to design everything from the spoon to the city. Um, am I correct in understanding that this is not what you want to do? You don't want to be Mark Rios, I design everything from the cup to the city. It's that your firm, with all its multiple la language, your, the, 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 the multiplicity of, of backgrounds and, and disciplines that you have represented in your firm, collectively are working on everything from the cup to the city. Absolutely. I think everyone on the, in, the, in our creative design ecosystem has some interest, some more than others, and I think it's in the scale of design problems. But some know some things about this one, and some know that things about that one, and it takes all of us to make really interesting hybrid solutions. I, I'm not the designer of those things. I'm interested in all of those things. And I hope to some degree I, I help curate those things. But um, at different times, on different problems, people take different roles and they have more authorship or a little lot, a lot less authorship or they may sort of pose more questions that roles change according to the problem statement. But overall, I think there's a collective belief and I think we should all have this collective belief the design has the potential to be broad. And that design has the potential to be life-changing. And that, but we need specialists that know deep information about various things. And that we need sort of generalists that look at the relationships and connections and overlaps between all those things in order to do things that work. And that if you're just a generalist, it may fail. If you're just a specialist, it's not going to be broad thinking. And so it's really this intersection between being deep in something and broad in lots of things that I believe enable um, more inventive work to happen. But in, in terms of, you know, the fact is what you've pointed out about the way people are trained to be designers is, is sort of oriented towards a specialization. Mm -hmm. And there were there are related but, but different sort of structures to that education and, and, and processes and approaches that come out at the end. Now you yourself, you have a degree in architecture and a degree in landscape architecture. So in your own head, you're carrying these two specializations. But when it comes to a team working together with those, what happens, and I ask particularly about those two disciplines because I was talking to, to, to an architect who said that he was bringing together landscape architects and architects. And he made this incredibly interesting observation about the difference in their approach. And he said, if you give a group of architects a site, within, like, immediately they've started designing the building. If you give the landscape architects the same site, they'll want to spend weeks doing analysis before they start coming up with a solution. And is that, is that, something you've experienced and what does it mean for when you then all sit around the table and start working on a project? Really good question. <laughs> um, I think that um, all um, curriculums for different kinds of fields have different origins about how they train people and about how you learn. And so we are all a a result of those kinds of curriculum methodologies. And so I think generally speaking, the Lansing of Architects start their education by sort of a systems kind of analysis approach about looking at environmental systems and ecology and all these kinds of things. And they're beginning to understand things through that. And I think that architects, this is a gross generalization, <laughs> start design training by thinking about objects and form and um, 
an, uh, through another set of ideas. And everybody is sort of on a spectrum of how they sort of deal with those things. But generally, I think we are all a result of how we've been trained. And that we evolve in our own life and our careers that we may move over here, we move, we move over there. But um, that fundamental training and discussing it here at the university, I think is really important. One of the things that we talked about a little bit that I get frustrated about, I think it's one of the problems why we all aren't more multidisciplinary is that I think most curriculums are so stacked with all the things that we think somebody needs to learn to be a landscape architect or an architect or you know a historian or whatever it is and that our curriculums are just stuffed and it's too bad that we can't have more voids voids, voids voids spaces empty spaces yes, to fill with if something there was you know instead of having you know 90 percent of our curriculum filled with sort of this is what you're supposed to be learning, require classes, and 10% for electives. If it was 75 and 25, or 60 and 40, I think that would start training people to be looking at all these other things that, that might inspire or contribute them. That in the course of your lifetime, you're gonna learn all those professional things. You're gonna learn what you need to learn, you know? You may not get a job if you don't have this when you get out, but what, I believe that the source in the university needs to be as a place that helps spark how you're going to think and solve problems for the rest of your life. And so I, it's tough, I think, when we look at, you know, what classes are offered and what you have to do that, that it's, it's full because there's a lot of things you have to learn. And sometimes I wish there was more space. It's like yeah. in all of our lives, we need more space. Yeah, I, it, no, you're right. All of our lives, because there is a, I mean, one, one gets the sense, you know, with the, what was it, the great resignation, you know, around the pandemic, perhaps, that, the, you know, there's, there's perhaps some stress levels with, with jobs that have become more and more sort of specialized, demand more and more specialization. Remember there used to be a time when everyone, when all doctors were primary care doctors, they could all do a bit of everything, but now all the doctors specialize because the industry and the, the massive, um, you know, um, college debt they have to pay off, you know, demands it, they have to go and specialize. And, um, and there is something of, we've, we, are we being turned into, are we becoming like the widgets that, you know, Fordism turned us, you, I, I guess I guess what I want to say is that we've is it sort of post industrialization that we have created a culture of specialization and that specialization has got more and more intense and are we are we actually now starting to try and push back against that to the extent it's possible so I say for example in your back to your own work back to your own work you do a lot of work that's sort of at the intersection of landscape and infrastructure there was, you know, we saw in the last century particularly, we saw land use siloed, zoning, freeways. They did one thing, they moved cars along. Zoning did one thing, spread houses into little units. And then um, the river, the river's channelized. It does one thing, it just sends the water out to sea. And now we're saying, no, we need to be more in, in integrative and you know, the Sixth Street Bridge is a bridge now, the viaduct is now a bridge that has a park and there's multiple modes of transit and, and your doings, you've, you've done a number of projects that are that, at, at that intersection. Is this something that's happening, do you think, this century? Are we, are we, are we trying to sort of throw off some of that very siloed way of treating our cities, actually? I think design firms today are trying to look broadly and comprehensively. And they're trying to have, um, they're trying to find ways of solving bigger problems. And so I think that's really fantastic. That's what they should be doing. I think that um, everyone shouldn't be, think that being a broad, sort of diverse kind of person is the only way to go. I, I mean, some of us, in some areas, I'm like a nerd. I just want to like do this because I really love it. And I really focused on it. Which areas and, are those? <laughs> I like some aspects of my garden. I'm like a total nerd or a freak. 
you know, and certain aspects of things that I gather, you know, I, that I collect, I'm really a nerd. So I guess I'm saying that I think everybody needs to follow their innate, you know, path. And so some of us, I think, by our nature, are a little more um, focused, and I think that's great. But I think we've tried to put everybody into that bundle of being a, space, a specialist. And I think we need to give permission to people to think broader, also to change their mind, to evolve over the course of career. I can't think of anything that's kind of a little more impressive than doing the same things for 40 years exactly, you know? That hopefully we're all evolving our interests, we want to challenge ourselves, we want to ask new questions. I think that um, our culture and our profession needs to give us the opportunities to evolve if that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll be renaissance people. Renaissance. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so let's talk about you, you yourself. Um, and to what extent, you've, you've talked about how our education shapes us, but also we ourselves, our, our lives, our, who we are shape, shapes us. And, and you recently gave a talk at USC where you talked very candidly about your own experiences, sort of not, I guess, fitting into what has been, what has been you know, understood as the, the patriarchy, being of Mexican descent, being gay, um, studying at USC, actually, when both of those were somewhat more marginalized. Um, what do you think that sort of personal side of you, how does that connect? To this, um, to this desire to to be to be much much more um, much more broad in your understanding and diverse in your reach. So I think um, I've had periods in my life, and I'm sure a lot of you have felt this too, that you've really resented this kind of inherent power structure, and. You know, whether it um, was this patriarchal model, and I think you know, see it a lot of that, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. And that I think probably more people in this room than less people in this room have at some point felt like they didn't have a place at the table or their voice really wasn't valued or that some other group of people were making all the decisions. And so I think my experience of you know, and I can recount experiences of being, feeling, um, people having preconceived ideas either about my background or my last name or my parents or about being gay and um, hiding that made me felt, feel like I wasn't um, a prime participant, that I was somehow pushed to the side. And I think that has helped make me feel committed to try to make sure we all have um, a voice, we all have a place at the table, we're all an important part of that decision. And I think it's easier for people that have been in that patriarchal role not to be inclusive. I think people that have had to sort of fight a little bit or have had those experiences fight harder for inclusion for everybody because they have some empathy of what that's like. And so, and I believe that's really important for this design thinking that we're talking about tonight. That I think that this really burning commitment that we have to try to hear from everybody. We have to hear from everybody's own background, their different experiences, that they're all important. We're gonna learn something by all of them and somehow the base idea has to come, up, come from as much of that as we can actually gather. And I think my experience is of feeling that kind of pain or like, why are they talking about that in front of me? It's just like, I can't believe it, you know? That those emotions compel me to make sure like, okay, I wanna hear from that person over there and I wanna hear from that person over there. What they have to say is somehow has the power to change the way I'm gonna think about this. Interesting. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it does. Else. It makes total sense. And it's definitely something that people increasingly understand is important in the boardroom, is important in the design process. Now, however, just to be devil's advocate, you know, we also now, there's an enormous amount of outreach that goes on in design. There's an enormous amount of um, stakeholder input 
which sometimes can, I guess, I guess, I guess that it has to be managed. It has to be managed if it's to be effective and one's not going to end up what, with a camel instead of a horse or whatever it is. So how do you, um, I guess, how do you manage that, the, that multiplicity of voices and make sure that you get a, a, um, a good design outcome, a coherent design outcome? Another complicated question. <laughs> um, you know, I think, for me, the key thing is trying to um, listen and hear key pieces of information and then to assemble those in a way that creates a vision that's so strong that as many people as possible can get behind and feel they're a part of. And so, for example, you know, when you started talking about like, well, the freeways just are freeways and these are just things, things are very, how do we ever change like planning in the city and so that we get to do this one thing that solves all those problems. And how do we do that? The only thing I was thinking about in the back of my mind is you have to listen to all the problems of the transportation specialist and the planning person and all these things. And then you have to assemble all those things and you create, hopefully, through all their piece of information and idea, or set of ideas that are powerful enough that they can see that they've been heard, but also that get them excited about what the idea can become. And I think part of our responsibility as designers is that we have to inspire. And that's the way you get things changed in the world, and the way you get things made, and the way you get things done, is you get stakeholders to get on board because they believe that their ideas and their concerns are represented in this vision. Do you feel you're heard in rooms where it's really essential to get this message? Because I, th I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm um, misspeaking when I say that a lot of municipalities are very, very bureaucratic. And there is a lot of siloing that goes on within departments and that and that often there's specialists within the departments and they don't necessarily come together in a coherent vision. Um, I certainly found that myself when I was just looking into the connection between um, adaptive reuse for environmental reasons, like making that connection and discovered how much, you know, there's preservationists over here and then there's environmentalists over here and then perhaps there's architects over here and they're not necessarily coming in the same room and saying, here's this holistic set of reasons for why one might want to preserve a building. It goes beyond just we the building's old and we love it. Um, so, um, so anyway, that's just one small example. But, but, but ha do you, are, are you in a position where you can say, uh, where, where you can get people from these different silo departments in the same room and understand the bigger picture? Once in a while, <laughs> you know, I think that it's you know it's a battle, and um, every case sometimes you have a few successes, and sometimes you have a few more, and sometimes you have a lot of successes. And so even if you get a few successes, it's successful. Um, but so I think the system is against you. I think the system is about these separate silos. Everybody has responsibilities, and they're going to get fired if they don't check other boxes. And so they expect you to fall in line and do all those kinds of things. And so to win, whatever that means, to succeed, you have to, you have to be able to satisfy what they need. You have to be able to satisfy what this person needs. But you have to be able to find and explain in a really non-threatening way what are the relationships and overlaps between those two things so that somehow they, everybody wants to be a part of something better. Right. And no matter if you're just responsible for, you know, checking the power requirements on the set of plans, everybody wants to be, to do something good if they can. And so I think it's part of trying to appeal to the aspirations of humanity of everybody and respect them and that they they want to do something. Most people want to do something right. Yeah. And you have to appeal to them. 
Um, in a moment, we're going to ask you all to, um, to come up with questions. And we actually have two mics here. So those of you that have a question, start making your way up to the mics. And, and while, while you're doing so, I'm just going to ask you, is there a particular project of yours that jumps out as one where it really worked? Uh, this, you did get the right people in the room. You were able to um, infuse a wide range of stakeholders with the vision, and, it, and the project really came out the way better, you know, the sum was better than all the parts. I'm looking at Nate here. So, <laughs> yeah, the gem set in my mind is our park for the city of Palm Springs. Started off completely, totally different than what it ended up. And so that process was really about hearing all these different people and getting different kinds of specialists, whether it's historian and the arts people, you know, the indigenous community, the ecologists, everybody. And somehow that project kept evolving and changing and iterating and becoming something that would have never have been come in the very beginning because of that act of being as inclusive as possible. And so I think that the best work ends up being something you never expected. And if your first diagram is what gets built, you probably haven't iterated enough. <laughs> you, haven't been, you haven't been inclusive enough. And it's that act of struggle and listening and evolution and releasing and that makes work better. And whenever somebody says, oh, I had to resign that four times, it's probably better the fifth time than it was the first, second, or third, fourth time. Hmm. And so that project comes to my mind because it was completely different than when we started. And so I encourage everybody to feel comfortable releasing ideas. I guarantee you that you will come up with another one. And somehow being able to say, okay, let go of that one. I really love it, but let go of it. <laughs> have the confidence there'll be something else that'll be so much more fantastic will come huh. believe it last question before we throw to, to to the questions coming at you um it how many let's just talk about this shirt because the shirt was chosen <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> this wasn't just something you just tossed on, you were in a rush and you grabbed it off the bed. You, you planned to wear the shirt. The shirt is fantastic. Um, it has a design story. How does it fit into the, everything we've talked about tonight? Okay, so this shirt <laughs> is a product of design thinking that none of us were really trained in our office as clothing designers. But this shirt was the process of a design thinking process that dealt with research and, you know, case studies, and then bringing in specialists. I remember Sonia in her office, who was from the Fashion Institute that made all these patterns and things. And I remember Carl, who was this sort of retail men's clothing guru, you know? So this year was a process of design thinking and deep thinking, and how do you kind of hybrid those together? And, you know, when the pandemic came and lots of things happened, this shirt tanked, basically, <laughs> you know. Um, we sold it for a while and then it ended. But this really proved, in my mind, the process. That design thinking can relate to a lot of different kind of design typologies. And sometimes, you know, they go somewhere and they're successful. Other times they're just research. But um, I, the shirt is, it's named here after my father. This is a Guayabara shirt that's been reinterpreted. And so culturally, Guayabara shirts were basically lunch boxes that people would put fruits in their lunch and when they would go out to the fields and work, and they would come home and wash them and go to a wedding. And so this shirt has all these little hidden pockets in it that I can put things, and it has little messages. Can you read that message? <laughs> Toto con amor. 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 Do everything with love. So the shirt. <laughs> sure. The shirt. With different kinds of cultural ideas and meaning. Oh, you knew that. <laughs> so it's a design experience. 
experiment. Like, yeah. it's okay to experiment. So, no, I mean it's a fabulous shirt, but but it was fun. It was a, it was one of in a way the voids in the day that you that you needed that you yes. filled with this creativity. It was a controversial, but yes. Really? I oh. Learned, I learned. I think we learned a lot about the process, of design, and making that I think we can apply those same kinds of things to other processes. Right, and with that, let us hear from our audience members uh, to the right first. My name is Matthew Asada. I'm a visiting senior fellow here from the State Department, and uh, so not an architect, not a designer. But I'm curious about uh, something you said about trying to um, incorporate unrelated fields. And I was wondering if you could give us an example in your practice. I'll give you three fields, and maybe you can speak to one of them, how you've used them, a linguist, a diplomat, or a historian if you can talk about how one of those three may have been involved in one of your projects or another field that you want to uh, invoke. You know, I think all of those, I could give examples of how we've used them. And historians are super easy, you know? And we've worked on, you know, projects in, for different cultures and different groups of people and how um, language and symbols um, tell stories, you know, have been, you know, incorporated into our work. We're working on a house right now that someone's asked us to get a gerontologist to be a part of that design process. And so um, it really is, that's why I said it's so important to be thinking about what are three other fields that somehow might solve this, help us solve this problem in some way you would have never thought about. So I, um, I think that's essential to be doing work that um, can be fresh. Question here? Good question. Hello, um, my name is Eva. I'm a third year at USC's MLA program. Um, and one thing I really love about our program is that it has a focus on community design and social impact. And um, I'm, I've been excited to see the field of design move towards that direction more. Um, uh, and I, I couldn't help but notice Rios's involvement in the Gondola Project, um, which has had a really negative community response. There's a coalition called Stop the Gondola that is a um, coalition of many different environmental org, community orgs. Um, a lot of people are really concerned about the negative impact of the gondola on the community in terms of privacy, gentrification, and environmental impact. Um, and I know Rios has also been involved in the Row downtown LA, which uh, has been protested a lot too, as the developer Atlas has been very predatory in gentrifying Chinatown. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, if you were aware of this community response, if um, Rios has any commitment or has been thinking more about the impact on the community um, as you're serving your clients and your designs. Thanks. Good question, and the answer is absolutely. We worry about it and think about it all the time. And one thing I wish, particularly for the Gondola project, I wish we could like make a huge billboard or something and put it someplace that showed how before any of those designs were formalized or thought about, we met with each one of those communities and constituent groups. And I can, uh, I can tell um, very specific um, instances of really hearing and listening what all those groups um, wanted and asked for and what their thoughts were and how the ideas were really based on what we heard. And what I think happens, unfortunately, in projects like that is that communities are really multifaceted and some part of this community over here may not know all the work you did with this part of the community over here. And so um, I feel that um, there was enormous effort spent in going through the process of understanding all the communities involved in that project to try to find a way of synthesizing all their ideas and values into a design solution. But new members came up, came up and they had other concerns we hadn't heard about. And I think we're still trying to find ways of solving all those collective things. But um, I think as a group of people, we are committed to hearing and thinking and I can't, you know, 
I could literally go through each single one of those communities and how much energy was spent trying to um, understand them before things were designed. But there's always somebody else. So how you solve that, um, for all of us, how we solve that, I'm not quite sure. I think trying to have the process be as transparent as possible so that um, everyone can see what you went through and what the process and how um, other ideas were sort of um, incorporated into it. Um, maybe that's the way we do it, but um, it's, it's complicated and difficult because you're not talking to the same people all the time. The groups constantly change and evolve. Well, and also the, the, what you've just touched upon is, um, is endemic to opening up the conversation. Because what we're talking about is a design process that is different from Robert Moses saying we're going to run freeways right. through the Bronx or the powers that be in, Santa, in LA saying we're going to run freeways through Boyle Heights and nobody has a say. Now we're in a different phase where we understand yep. that we must do far more um, community outreach, and that's not that's it can be a very conflicted and yep. fractious process. Yep. And so, um, so, so in a way, it's almost an inevitable. This kind of d dispute is a is a sort of almost inevitable part of this new process. So, so it's the part that you refer to, which is conflict. Let's go to this question here. Hi, my name is Xavier. I'm a freshman here at USC, and when we were seeing a number of Rios projects on the slideshow up there, I noticed a lot of green, as in vegetation everywhere, above buildings, under buildings, on the sides of buildings. Um, I thought that was super cool, and I was wondering if you would be willing to talk about um, what do you imagine our cities looking like in terms of how green they could be, physically green with vegetation incorporated in the urban infrastructure? You know, I think that we're all looking at how do we make a healthier environment? And how do we sort of bring back ecosystems that have maybe been obliterated by development? And so whether if it's um, literally greening or whether it's trying to make more um, corridors for birds or insects or whatever it is, how do we take and make a healthier place? And so every project that we're working on, we're trying to think about those kinds of things. And sometimes it's, you know, enveloping landscape and architecture. And I would like to sort of take down as many separations as, and distinctions as possible. And, but I think it's all about trying to make a healthier place. And, and you did say that one of your great passions is gardening. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Question here. Hi, uh, my name is Jason Lee. I'm actually an alum. Um, my major was biomedical engineering, and my minor was architecture. And um, thank you both for a very profound uh, conversation tonight. Um, as an Asian gay, um, grew up in Taiwan in the 80s and 90s, um, I can resonate with lots of what you talk about. And my question is, um, so before the lecture, we saw your slides, and lots of your projects are actually done in Shenzhen, China. And Shenzhen is one of the most modern and avant-garde city in China. Um, I want to ask, um, while you're doing project there, is there any obstacle that you face and how do you overcome them? That's the first question. The second question is, uh, what do you think is that, um, is there any shift in Chinese, say, um, environmental design or landscape architecture uh, compared to like 10 years ago? Thank you so much. You know, I think, um, to be really honest, we don't have a lot of work built yet. And that in the last five years, our practice has really been broadening. And so we've been doing a lot of um, really incredible design thinking and um, partnering with different, um, you know, developers and sort of governments to try to think of ideas. And we're just beginning to be at the point where we maybe can start realizing some things. And what the changes, the, the answer to the second question, I think that there's a much more of a um, understanding and a passion and a value in 
um, incorporating the historic fabric and uh, the evolution of a place and seeing how all that incorporates with sort of new development as opposed to sort of having clean slate developments. And I would say that most of the projects I saw 10 years ago were sort of on clean slates. And I think it's fantastic now we're really looking at um, how we honor and respect um, the layers of any particular site and make our ideas inspired by some of those things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> to the right, Elizabeth, one of my students. <laughs> Hi, I would say my name, but you already said it for me. <laughs> um, I want to start off with saying thank you to you two and also our wonderful interpreters and all the staff who made today possible. Um, we've spoke, you've spoken a lot about like generalists and specialists. So I am very curious, do you, what do you identify as a generalist or a specialist? Generalist. But I have specialist tendencies. <laughs> <laughs> Which are? Oh, too long to list. <laughs> We're all, I think we're all nerds in some ways, right? And that's good. So I think we're a combination of we want to think broadly, but also we're really nerdy and passionate about a few things based on our own individual interests and experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for being here. Um, my question is, so your firm does a lot of work around the world. So how do you ensure designers in one area are knowledgeable of like culture, context, and climate conditions in the area they're designing for? Great question. Um, we try really hard. <laughs> I think part of it is that um, we hire, find, collaborate with people in different places that know a lot about that place. We don't assume that we can come in as an outsider and sort of know it all. So part of it is really, again, it's about finding that specialist that knows depth in a particular place, whether it's in a craft or a location, whatever it is. And so um, that's part of it. Part of it is also by trying to have a design process that asks a lot of questions that you learn to start asking about every place you go to, you know? And so um, you don't want to forget anything. And so, you know, whether you're looking at sort of you know, issues of ecology and topography and systems and temperature and climate, or you're looking at issues of culture and community and history, or you're looking at issues of economics and jurisdiction and approvals and all those kinds of things. After a while, you start kind of understanding these are all the possible things that you need to begin to start thinking about if you're gonna go and do work here, or work here, or work there. And the priorities and what those things are change radically. But I think there's kind of a, I hate to say this because it sounds really done this, but kind of a scope of pertinent things you need to be thinking about no matter where you're going to be operating. But what those answers are and the priority is and what you find is radically different. Thank you. We're sort of going right left, there we go. Uh, hi, I'm Juan, I'm a second year architecture student. Um, thank you for the conversation. And um, it seems to me it's very clear on your interest in seeing different fields and interests and backgrounds. And I wanted to ask, as a student and as a professional, and I acknowledge these may be a little different, how do you see going in depth into many fields, but also going into a different breadth of fields um, how do you think we should navigate that? Because I, and I think a lot of people here have a lot of interests that we really want to go deep into. So. Um, I guess my advice first off is life is long. <laughs> and so you probably can't do it all at once. And so maybe you say, okay, for this period of time, I'm gonna kind of focus a little bit on this and I'm gonna kind of go deep on it not thinking that I'm going to have to make a commitment to that forever and ever and ever, 
but then at the same time, I'm interested in a few of these things over here, and I'm gonna try those things too because they may inform this area that I'm kind of going deep in. And then you sort of see how it goes. And then as you, you live your life and you learn more, either your area of depth is gonna go in the same direction or it's gonna sort of deviate and go over here. Then you still gotta be learning different things, you know? And so I think there's no singular answer, it really depends on the person, but maybe I think we have to all give ourselves a break that we have a long life to learn. And so you don't have to do it all tomorrow or next year. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maciel. Um, thank you so much for the conversation earlier. I'm interested in hearing about you, Mark, uh, in your early professional career. If there, if you could think back on a time you first got stumped on a design solution and maybe some unconventional ways that are creative to help you solve through solution? So I think sometimes all of us as designers, we get saddled with something we don't want, whether we're forced into a group project, oh my God, there's this really person in that group I don't want to work with, or you're starting to develop a project and all of a sudden the client changes their mind or something happens and it's like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I hate this and you know, it's gonna ruin my ideas. And after a while, if you keep going through that process, that you kind of have enough faith, you learn to have faith that it's still gonna end up being good or better. And so when you get stumped on design, I wanna say like, kind of get used to it, this is gonna always be happening. <laughs> but then learn to say, okay, how do I get unstumped? What do I look at, you know? Or if some problem comes in that's really awful, say, okay, like, you know, how can I make this into lemonade? How can I do something with it? So I think it is, um, you have to be transformative. And everything that you're dealt, you have to make something out of it. And you have to realize that every single time you come up against that wall, I'm gonna get better, I'm gonna go right through it, I'm gonna learn something else and it's gonna get better. That's what you have to do. Thank you, Mark. But Mark, at that point, is that also the time when you call into the room, like somebody brought up talking to the diplomat, I think it was, is that when you, turn, is that in a moment of sort of writer's block or designer's block, you actually sort of talk to someone completely Yes, different. that's when I say, like, Bob, what are we going to do? <laughs> or Mark, what do we do? You know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Or you say to someone that is completely outside of your field of conscience, like, what do you think about right. this? Right. But you don't have to do it yourself then, so right? You don't live You've got with all the these yourself. people that you can, you know, get ideas from. Uh, hello. How do you balance containing costs and timelines with a more democratic process of development? <laughs> That's a hard one. The million dollar question. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. Um, you know, I think that every project has some set of goals and objectives, and it may be to make a community better. It may be to, um, you know, invent some kind of solution in some sort of way. But I also think um, issues of viability, and I want this thing to happen, you know? And it, there's this, there's, you know, the Olympic is coming, or there's some sort of thing that makes time an important kind of thing. So I think that cost and time and being a responsible professional are just other goals you have for your project. And you want to achieve all your goals. And you've got to take all your goals seriously. And the only way you're going to get the next project was by doing really good on this project. And so if you, you've got to deliver it, you've got to make it work, you've got to do as much as you can, but you've got to make something that's aspirational and terrific. You've got to do it all. Two more questions. Hey, 
Um, I'm Miranda Davila. I'm a fourth year in the in the Bachelor's of Science Architecture program, and I was also really interested in about the generalist and specialist distinction that you made. But um, on paper, you know, at the beginning, your bachelor's undergrad architecture, master's architecture, um, landscape architecture. I was kind of wondering on any advice on the the type of confidence that it takes to say like, yes, you can do buildings and you can do landscape very well. But as like a business owner and as an architect being like, well, you know what, I can design a cup and I can do it very well. So if you could talk about that sort of leap of faith, maybe. I just want to encourage everybody to be kind of fearless. And that, you know, we didn't know how to design cups or shirts or, you know, whatever we did whenever we did it. And I think you just have to say, okay, I'm going to like go for it. And one of the things that's really unique, I have to say, is you go through different points in your life. And right now, the power of our office is based on people that are younger than I am. And the reason being, and I say that collectively, because I'm like the oldest one, um, <laughs> but collectively, that at different points in your life, you're more fearless than you are in other times in your life. And one of the blessings of um, less experience, I don't wanna say youth, because that doesn't sound right, is you're more fearless. And so, I think we all need to kind of get back to that innocence sometimes of trying to be fearless. And we have to also empower people that maybe don't have as much experience as we are that we have because they don't have all the pain that we have. They haven't gone through all those issues. They're fearless. And so fearlessness is important. Yeah, fearlessness though with some level of perhaps also respect for specialization because you're talking about a place that's sort of you're raising questions about to what extent does one throw, reject specialization in favor of generalization but what does that and certainly today when everybody ha, can you know everybody can use the computer and do all sorts of different things on the computer they can be a filmmaker they can be a graphic designer they can be a podcaster on and on and on and we're in this period where we can, where we really can try and be do everything, but is that disrespecting specialization? You know, people who really can do things well and intensively. So I guess that's been alluded to by by the questioners, but it's something worth just pondering that balance. I guess getting that right. But we have more questions, and where is um, Keiko? Just to tell me about uh, time. Um, how, we're almost done here, I think. We are almost done, but I want to make sure go. everybody gets in a question. So, so let's let's do it. Four more questions. Here we go. So, uh, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm in the fourth year program, and also I'm a part of mostly I'm um, focusing on environment friendly with adding more green space. And also, I realize that uh, we have a lack of the water. For example, in the California, we have a lack of the water. So I want to know that. What can we do for the future, same time we are struggling with the global warming? Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, I was saying that uh, uh, in the California, as an example, we have a lack of the water so for the plant. So, and also we have a global warming that's happening. So uh, what do you think as an architect so that can do something? or better to have a more cleaner, more healthy environment as an architect. So he's so talking about the environment. No, I got it, I got it. I love that question. And I think that, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that that question involves, you know, it deals with about water management, it deals about our environment, about um, how buildings can do different things for us to sort of, um, catch, maintain, be careful with water. Um, you know, I think that all of us need to take one issue like that and then say, what are all the ways that we can address it in a way that's kind of meaningful? Um, so it's something we all need to be asking about in our work. 
and it's something that matters to you a lot. I mean, yeah. we could have spent the whole hour talking yeah. about the environment yeah. and how to, be, how to bring together um, different heads around the table. Um, do you feel like you've got your answer? Yes. <laughs> Over to you. Um, I'm Chloe Hernandez. I'm in eighth grade, and uh, I'm a student in, in ELAC architecture program. I came to be inspired by your lecture, but all I see is gentrification in our communities. How is your company helping the community without displacing them? The displacement question again. How's your, how's, how's your work? You know, it's, um, it's a complicated set of issues. I think, you know, we, we ask ourselves a lot about how does our work do with issues of gentrification? And does this project mean that it's going to displace a community? And we can't, some things we can, we can stop, other things we can try to be a part of its evolution to incorporate and make it a better solution that it might not be. Um, so the only answer I have for you is that we are, we are conscious of it. And we all need to be asking those questions. You know, our office is really close here. It's in Crenshaw. And the sort of changes in Crenshaw in the last five or 10 years have been huge. And I think we're really conscious and worry about how is that community and how is that sort of neighborhood changing based on all these economic changes that are happening? And how does it affect the people that have their homes there? And um, so I think it's a huge issue for all of us as design professionals to be thinking about. Are we good? Yes. Well. Mark Rears. Thank you. What a you were amazing. To talk to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. You were amazing. Thank you, everybody. You were amazing. What a pleasure. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all of you for, for being here to 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 give Mark um, what a love you know, yeah. all your attention and hear him speak and congratulations on being the first speaker right. at Visions and Voices. Thanks everybody. Yeah.